Hello. Hello, it's Pastor Larson here with Trinity Lutheran Church inviting you to our Sunday morning Bible study and also inviting you to our worship in person or online, 8.30 and 10.30. This is the Sunday morning Bible study, usually broadcast at 10 o'clock on Sunday. And the question before us is still, who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Last time we continued looking at how Jesus showed himself to be the Messiah, the Savior, by the miracles that he did. I think you recall this passage from 1 Peter 3.15 that we should always be ready. Mm -hmm. We should always be prepared to make a defense to anyone that asks us for a reason for the hope that is in us. Well, that's sometimes hard to do. And one of the ways we can do it is by <laughs> paying attention to the miracles that Jesus did. That's the reason that we are looking at this mountain of evidence that are that is in the Bible that enables us to defend our faith if anybody asks us, why do you believe in Jesus? Well, we've looked at the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, and we've looked at some New Testament witness to Jesus Christ. Both of those are the Word. But today we want to do some more looking at the public miracles of Jesus. The, the summary of what we study about Jesus is to study his person and his works. The miracles, of course, fall under the category of what did Jesus do that showed him to be the Messiah, the Son of God with power? Our aim is that the Lord will use his word to give us more confidence in our faith. Who is Jesus? Well, how many diseases are there? How many diseases are there? Anybody have an idea? Is this human or animal or? Human good? diseases. Thank you for that clarification. Oh, I would probably say thousands. One website said there are 30,000. Another said there are more than 100,000. I suppose it depends on how many subclassifications you make. 30,000 diseases. Only a third of them are treated effectively. So that's only 10,000. We've got 20,000 diseases that are a problem. So how does Jesus treat disease? Dis-ease. It's a simple word, isn't it? When we are at ease, we're usually talking about how we feel. But the word really means that something is wrong with the human body. Mentally, physically, or a combination of both of those. So let's look at the public miracles of Jesus that point to how he healed diseases as he walked and talked for about three years on the face of this earth. They show and they reveal. And I think it's, it's okay to say that his miracles prove that Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah, Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament, because when he does the healing, he fulfills the prophecies that say he will do the healing. And you're familiar with some of those. We looked at them two or three weeks ago. Who is Jesus? In looking at the miracles of Jesus, I want us today to contend with those who doubted his disease, his de deity, I'm sorry. Jesus was accused at one point in his ministry of using Beelzebul. In another translation, it's Beelzebub to cast out demons. And Jesus said, that's not possible because a house divided against itself cannot stand. That is, if I'm using Beelzebub to cast out other Beelzebubs, it, it, it could not be that, that the house, the house, the collection of all those evil demons would stand. 
You see, they would be against one another. So what did Jesus say? Would someone read Luke 11? Judy, you're first up. <clears throat> for, you say that I, <clears throat> for you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is my, by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Interesting passage because it, it shows that Jesus, with the power of God, because he is God in the flesh, is doing this casting out of demons. He has power that no one else has. But I want you to look at that last line. If it is by the finger of God that I'm doing this, that I have power over the demons, I want you to know something. The kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, let's talk about the kingdom of God. What is that? It's not an earthly kingdom. It doesn't have borders, and, and it doesn't have presidents and, and uh, princes or kings. The, the kingdom, well, it has a king. Yes, it does. But the kingdom of God is the presence of God in you. The kingdom of God is the collection of all the believers, including those who have died and gone on to be with him. And it is ruled by grace in the hearts of those who believe. The kingdom of God is something that cannot be seen, cannot be located in a physical way. It doesn't have borders. It is not this earth. I want you to know all those things about the kingdom. We could study that as a separate topic sometime. But if it is, Jesus said, by the finger of God that I cast out <laughs> demons, then this is evidence, evidence that the kingdom of God has come upon you. It has. Sorry, that I interrupt that's you, okay. No, that, but that's, I need to. to sure. She need to change it shirt because she's wet. Yes. Oh. And she don't let me do it. Okay. Can you talk uh, to her? Yes. Please. I'm gonna try to. Uh, to there we go. Thank you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. Let's go on. I want you to think about the works of Jesus this morning, especially his miracles. Uh, that's our subtopic under the question, who is Jesus? What did Jesus say about the works he was doing, the miracles he was doing? Do you remember what he said? Well, he said a lot of things. I don't want you to guess. I'm going to give it to you. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. They bear witness the works don't have a voice, do they? They don't have words. But when you describe the miracles of Jesus, you have to use words. And if you were there and saw the miracles being performed, and if you now look through the eyes of the gospel writers and see the miracles of Jesus, they are, as I often say, like pointers. They go into the court of human opinion, and they say, this is the Jesus prophesied in the Old Testament. This is the Jesus who has come in the New Testament times, who bore our sins in his body on the tree of the cross in order to bring us to God, and who raised or was raised, both are true, from the dead by the glory of the Father, and now lives to make intercession for us. The works of Jesus that he was doing, and he did them in the Father's name with his power, they bear witness about him. That's a powerful statement. Jesus also said, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, and the parentheses that we could put in there, he certainly is doing them. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works 
that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. There is a principle of witness in a court or in any human interaction that goes way back into Old Testament times. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned it here before, and that is a person cannot bear witness about himself or herself. It's a, a prejudicial thing. Um, you would, of course, um, tell everybody that you're a good person, right? You would not uh, admit all your faults before the people that you know. You would hide inside yourself and uh, not bear witness about yourself. In fact, the world is too full of people who are constantly bearing witness about themselves. <laughs> Don't make application of that too fast. Keep it in the mirror that you see in the, in the morning. Believe the works that I'm doing. The works prove. His mouth about himself was not a sufficient witness. There would have to be a second witness. And, and there were, of course, in the baptism and the transfiguration, when the Father's voice was there, and in the case of the baptism, when the Holy Spirit was there. But other than that, who is bearing witness about Jesus? Well, Matthew is, and Mark, and Luke, and John, and Peter, and Paul, and John, and <laughs> the list is, is a little longer than that. They bore witness about the Jesus that they had witnessed with their own eyes or the ones they had interviewed who were eyewitnesses. All of these who saw the works of Jesus continued to tell what they saw and heard. They bore witness. The court was not a court of law, but the court of the world. And they were open and and above board about everything they said about him. They did not hide. And that's one of the proofs itself that they did not hide, but continued to tell the whole world that they knew of about Jesus. Believe the works and the purpose that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. I don't try to explain that word in. Mm -hmm. This is deep theology that is not understood by anyone, except when you talk about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. And the mystery of Jesus is that he is God and man in one person, one of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. Now, that's a little bit too much, much theology uh, for Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to, uh, we talked about the human diseases before, and we said maybe there's 30,000 or 100,000. Can you name some of the many, many diseases of the skin? No. Cancer. Pardon? Cancer. Cancer. Eczema, eczema uh, psoriasis. Cases, <clears throat> uh, ulcers. Pardon? Stasis ulcers. Well, that's one I've never heard of. Well, that's ulcers when people get ulcers that bleed on their uh, due to poor okay. circulation. How uh, about infection? Infections, yeah. Yeah. Inflammation. Right. Dandruff. <laughs> oh, dandruff. Oh. Uh, all kinds of bug diseases, scabies. Did you say scabies fungal? And parasites. Did you say fungal diseases? Uh, not yet, but that's there too. <laughs> oh, can there be viruses and as well as fungus, fungal diseases of the skin? Uh, I, I have one called Moria, or Moria, and it makes a shiny skin, which is not normal. Uh -huh. But it's there, been uh, uh -huh. what do you call it, biopsied a lot. Oh, and there's a uh, people get a redness of the of the parts patches of skin on their face. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what that is called. Okay. There's birth, there's uh, birthmarks, those like those, uh, I can't remember what, like the, they look like a, a blood blotch type of thing. Oh. I can't remember what you call those. Are those, um, is that, that's a disease, huh? Well, you're, you know, you're born with it. It, it can be cured by laser now, nowadays when a child is born and real young before it gets large and big. Oh. Um, and there's rosacea. Yeah. 
Yes. That's what I was thinking, the, the red. Yeah, the watch. Well, the skin, the, the, skin oh. our, the skin is our biggest organ, largest organ, so it probably has the most problems. Judy, that I know it's true. I've heard it, but I, it's, isn't it hard to believe that the skin is the largest? Think of the dermatologist uh, that um, if I'm a, a disease specialist in liver or, or kidney disease, my list is, is fairly limited. But if I'm a dermatologist, I have uh, hundreds and hundreds of diseases to contend with. It's a, it's a complex thing and it takes observation. Uh, plus what, what plus whatever we put on our skin is absorbed into our system, which a lot of people sometimes you know are not as careful about what we rub on our skin and are putting into our body. It's just as bad as um, just as bad as if we're eating it. Um, and a lot of medications are now delivered through the skin through patches of mm -hmm. that sort. So at first, when we're, when we're young and we don't know any better, the skin appears to be a barrier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, it is porous. Mm -hmm. Very porous. And that can be a good thing, as you said, when we're trying to deliver disease, uh, deliver effective. Um, and it and it can be a bad thing when we're working around a lot of chemicals and things, uh, you know, out in the fields and spraying or taking mm -hmm. care of our yard or spraying bug spray in the house and all those sorts of things. That goes through our skin. The reason I'm bringing this up is that when you read of miracles of Jesus and you come upon those who have a skin disease. Leprosy, we forgot leprosy. Leprosy is the one that's usually mentioned. It's called Hansen's disease now, I believe. Oh, I didn't know that. But I know that many Bibles have a footnote on the word leprosy. And at the bottom of the page, you'll find that leprosy is a name for one of the many skin diseases that people had. So we can't really tell whether they were lepers or had some other kind of disease. But I'll stick with the translation that's most common and say that they were 10 lepers. Otherwise, I'll have to defend uh, my answer. So here we go with yeah. an, uh, the the. The miracle of Jesus, we're going to cover several miracles today, not all of them. And the first one that I have up for us is the cleansing of the leper. Would someone read Matthew 8, 1 to 4? I'll read. Okay. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Well, Jesus did something that you weren't supposed to do. And that's be close to a leper because it was highly contagious. You'll remember that a leper had to go through the streets crying, unclean, unclean, so that anybody, kind of sounds like today's disease too, uh, <laughs> anybody would know as a warning, stay away from this person. You don't want to get what he or she has. A leper is a person who has a contagious disease of the skin. And he came before Jesus and knelt. He didn't say unclean, unclean. Okay. Now, I said it was similar to today's disease because with our fear of contracting COVID-19, we want anyone who has the disease and knows they have it to stay away from us. Right. I don't see anyone going through the streets of any town or going into restaurants saying, unclean, I have COVID-19. They're supposed to stay home. Okay. I think po poison ivy is probably a modern day one that we still see that you can get by contact. Okay. 
years ago, those lepers were isolated. They had leper colonies. Yeah. Uh, they, they picked an, an island somewhere and shipped them all out to be by right. There was an island uh, in our uh, Hawaiian islands, a very small island. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, one of the churches sent a missionary to bring the gospel to them and to preach to them and to worship with them. And he didn't make any progress at all. They didn't seem to have any relationship with him. Well, after all, he was different. They were lepers and he was not. Um, the, the story ends this way, and it's a true story, that he began to make contact with them with the gospel when one time he got up and preached to them and he said, we lepers hmm. we lepers because he had by some contact gotten the disease and now he was one of them and he had his compassion on them was more effective than anything he could have said uh, You've heard that story before? Mm. Oh, yes. Well, thank you for bringing it up. So this leper came to him. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And you see the faith in that leper. Mm. You can make me clean. And Jesus uh, went against both custom and medical knowledge by touching him. And he said, I will, that is, I answered your question, if you will, I certainly will you, I want you to be clean. And then the simple words in Greek, it's only one word, be clean. Right. The word immediately is, is not, he goes through a period of suffering and, and eventually it goes away, it's immediately. Jesus' miracles are immediate. I don't, I can't think of one that is not immediate. Now he, the leper has to go, the former leper, the ex-leper, has to go by the command of Moses and show himself to the priest. And the priest would say, I have examined you. Uh, I've never understood why a priest could examine without getting the disease himself, but the leper would not go to the priest unless he was cleansed. You must have had telemedicine. <laughs> what kind of medicine? Telemedicine that we're doing oh. over the computer now. <laughs> uh, at a distance. At a distance. So verse uh, four, Jesus commands him, say nothing to anyone, but go yourself, go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded there was a thank offering that was commanded at various points in a person's healing. And uh, I, I thought about that. I've thought about that personally. You and I have been healed of many diseases in our lifetime. Could you, could you count them? No. You can count the big ones, right? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you name some diseases if you want to be personal? That's okay with me. That you've been healed of? We've oh that have been healed of? Yes. Oh. Oh. Cancer. Yeah, breast cancer. Breast cancer has uh, been very healable. Yeah. Right. Uh, Five for, years clean. Uh, Eleven years clean. Okay, but that's the 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 minimum. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Now um, many, many cancers are the result, they believe, of uh, something going wrong in the chromosome. I don't understand that. Uh, I don't understand how it happens, but um, that's what went wrong with me. Some of my chromosomes got got changed, and that um, gave rise to the plasma not uh, obeying the rules that God had uh, when He designed us. But that's I'm not going to go into that. I'm just talking about the idea that we have been healed of many diseases. Start with a common cold. Right. Yeah. Right. 
And some of the childhood diseases. Ah. They, uh, <laughs> they cured polio years ago. Before the shots, we all got chicken pox and mumps and measles with their childhood diseases. Right. And, and it was like, get it over with, get them, and now you're not <laughs> going to get them again. Oh, yeah, well, uh, here comes they do come back. <laughs> here come shingles, uh, which is the shingles is the same as what? Chicken pox. Chicken <laughs> So the disease, uh, whatever that thing is, it stays in your body. Yeah. And under periods of stress or other things, it might come back. It pops out again. <laughs> the immune system uh, backs down. I had it four years ago, a small case. I was very fortunate. Mm -hmm. It started in the back of my head, went down the, behind my ear and down into the right jawline and ended right there. That's it. It follows the nerves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh, that wow. nerve pattern um, ended there. Okay. And uh, then, of course, after that was healed, I went and got the, the two shots. And now, uh, and you can get a shot for, to prevent or <clears throat> does it prevent? It may, it may reduce uh, the a seriousness of a case um, if you do get it, it okay. like the flu, kind of like the flu also. I, I see. Well, how many other diseases have you been healed of? You named the, some of the biggies, but uh, how, we didn't mention acne when we were talking about skin diseases. Oh, yeah, acne. But oh, most of us, our hormonal systems finally yeah. got in order in, in our late teens or early 20s, and we finally, most of us got rid of that. Mm -hmm. We uh, probably have had boils. Boils. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, there's just general rashes people get from um, allergic reactions to foods like, uh, I'm thinking of Pastor Green when he was allergic to the mangoes and uh, who we had here at one time and, that, and you break out uh, food allergies that you break out in rashes. And you, and you learn to avoid them so you don't get them. Okay. Yeah, no, no allergies. I had psoriasis that came on spontaneously when I was 54. Wow. I mean, the, the classic elbows, knees, feet, hands. I'm sorry. It, it was. It was like, I couldn't believe it. And I'm working in a hospital. I had to wear gloves. You know, they didn't, um, they didn't know it, the patients, because... Um, you know, it's normal to wear gloves in a hospital. But anyway, um, so they told me it would never go away. And as I proceeded, it slowly went away on my elbows and knees. Then it went away to my fingers and not my total hand. And by the time I was 62, it was only on my fingertips. So it does go away. I mean, this went away. It came on spontaneously and it gradually went away. I don't know what the difference was. It was a, it was a hard time, like every, everybody's life. But um, it's actually, you wouldn't even know I ever had it now. Really, many, really. many diseases. Uh, I didn't mean to go on to the next one, but this cleansing of the leper is a, a, a proof of the deity of Christ and this leper was healed. Now, this is not the same as the, the 10 lepers. That comes later. There is a paralytic. Um, I would like someone to volunteer to read Matthew 9, verses 2 through 8, please. Anybody? Is that last line obscured by a green, uh, a green bar? Or can you read the last line of eight? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, please it's, go ahead. Do you want me to read Matthew 9? Yes, please. Okay. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, 
your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Thank you. Thank you for reading. Hmm. Um, I have not seen many paralyzed people in my life. Have you? No. Yes. As a nurse, you certainly would have. Mm -hmm. uh, par paralysis can be caused by disease or injury. Mm -hmm. Uh, by a disease of the brain, and it is a, a, a hard sight to see. We value our mobility very highly. I have a friend in Indiana who is a retired pastor, and he and his wife uh, live together. They have two daughters, and they're active in the church, and um, we are fairly close to them. And I get a message from him. I'm on his mailing list almost every day. Well, what I've seen, and he's about 10 years older than I am, he has almost completely lost his mobility. When I saw him a couple of years ago, we were up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and we had dinner. He needed help getting from his walker into his car. And the man is, is over six feet tall, and I'm sure he weighs well over 200 pounds. It, and his wife is a little girl, she's small. And he has to have people with him. He's not a paralytic, but he's getting close. And I, and I looked at him and I said, oh, no. Is that what I'm going to be in 10 years? We don't want to lose our mobility even if we're not totally paralyzed. Do you, I'm, I'm getting into the heart of the story. A paralytic is, is pitied, but not cured in many societies because there's not much you can do. How do you heal a paralytic? Can't. Um, I don't, I don't here, I'm, what is usually the problem? Sometimes there are, you know, physical therapy. Sometimes there are medications that can um, control the nerve endings, depending upon what's causing the paralysis. But many times it's only a temporary thing, sad to say. Um, the body is what it is. We know that we're not immortal mm -hmm. until, until after the resurrection. <laughs> So are you saying most of the para paralysis is due to the nervous system breaking down in some way? Um, yeah, it's, that's, the, the nervous system is, is affected because we know in strokes that sometimes it's a blood vessel that breaks, but it goes in and it causes damage then to the nervous okay. system, which is our brain and that sort of thing. So it can be a there are diseases of the muscular system as well, right? Right. There's the, there's the palsies and there's, you know, I think of Guillain-Barre, um, I think of Lou Gehrig's disease, which doesn't affect the brain, but it affects the muscles. Uh, multiple sclerosis um, is, you know, all of those types of diseases cause progressive, usually progressive type of paralysis. Parkinson's is another one. Um, and of course that is, uh, no, Parkinson's is related and put into the field of the dementia. It falls under the dementia umbrella um, also because of changes. So, um, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of diseases out there. All right. Paralysis. The cause of this man's disease was not given, of course, but the diagnosis is clear. He, he cannot walk, he's paralyzed. Now, Jesus, uses this situation to prove something that they are not expecting. And instead of saying, take heart, your paralysis is healed, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. Whoa, 
only God can forgive sins. That's their reaction, although they don't say that in so many words. But Jesus, being God, knows how to read thoughts. Why do you think evil? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? Well, uh, he doesn't give him a chance to answer. He says, rise and take up your bed and go home. And there he gets into trouble because it's a Sabbath. <laughs> and he rose and went home. And again, it's instantly. He doesn't have to go to physical therapy for eight weeks, which you might expect. In this case, we aren't told how long the man had paralysis. The reaction of the crowds is something that we might expect if it happened today. It says they were afraid. That doesn't mean they uh, cowered in fear and they were thinking that uh, they were in danger. It wasn't that kind of fear. It's the fear that goes along with faith. We should fear and love God, that kind of fear. I know it's difficult to explain, but if someone did a miracle in your midst and you knew it was the finger of God that performed the miracle, not the man himself, or not the woman herself, you would fear and glorify God. It is God who had given to his son the authority on earth to forgive sins and to heal diseases. I know that we're spending more time than I intended on each of these miracles. But I thought, well, why, why rush through them? We have parts of the New Testament that we have not studied in our Bible class. I don't know. I'm sure you have once or uh, twice in your life. But you haven't taken them all together, probably, as one topic, the miracles of Jesus. Right. Go ahead and react. I was going to say something. All right. Well, we have lost the, uh, the clicker. Now we have a man who has um, the another type of paralysis. Mm -hmm. I would like you to read John 5, 2 through 9. Um, I'll do that. Go ahead. Uh, now there is in Jerusalem, Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in aromatic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these, lay, in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up and while I am going another while I am going another steps down before me Jesus said to him get up and take your bed and walk and at once the man was healed he took up his bed and he walked John 5 2 9 thank you 38 years no hope I've been an invalid I've been paralyzed for most of my life. I can't get into the pool. I don't understand that, that there was a superstition that if I went down into the pool and the water was uh, rippled by the angel, that there was some power in the water. I have never understood that. If someone has an answer to that, go ahead. But he never made it into the pool because he was a paralytic. He couldn't get, get there quickly. Do you want to be healed? Hmm. Wasn't it the first person in the pool only? Yes, and, oh. and that's a mystery to me, is why if the if an angel rippled the pool, why couldn't the angel ripple the pool again and, and okay. cause many to be healed? I say, I've never understood that, and I've read the commentaries, and they don't seem to... It's one thing about commentaries. They're very helpful when you kind of already know the answer, or you think you do. 
And then you come across something like this and you read, you read three commentaries and they seem to ignore um, verse seven, when the water is stirred up. Or they give a tradition that's not supported uh, very well. Um, it's kind of, I think, you know. <laughs> Do you know we don't know everything? Okay, yeah. You accept that, don't you? <laughs> yes. Have, have you read Isaiah recently? Anybody? I am reading a, a chapter a day through Isaiah. I haven't gotten very far. There's so much that I don't understand. When I read this uh, verse 7, I don't understand it. And I guess that's, that's okay. Do you expect your pastors to know everything about the Bible? Nope. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but it is a miracle of Jesus. He said, get up and take up your bed and walk. And he did. Again, it was instantaneous. All right, keep that in mind. We're going to sum this up in a moment. There is the man with a withered hand. Uh, another reader, please, for Mark 3, 1 to 5. Oh, I'll read it. Um, again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Instantaneous. A withered hand is a, is a hand that's lost its ability to function, whether it's a, a disease of the nervous system or the muscles, we can't tell, but it was without strength and it may have become uh, smaller, withered. Mm -hmm. This is an unusual disease, but there are people whose limbs did not, as they were growing, uh, part of their body did not mature, did not come to its full strength. So let's take that as the disease, uh, the withered hand. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Sabbath problem as part of our study, but they were often, as you remember, trying to find something with which to accuse Jesus. And the healing on the Sabbath was their biggie. Well, Jesus said, which is better, to do good or harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? And they couldn't answer him because the answer was obvious. So he looked around them with anger. Does it bother you that Jesus was angry? No. Why not? Well, because he knew what was right. He knew what was right in human life, uh, as far as I'm concerned. I almost wondered if he sometimes, <laughs> and I'm assuming, did he, um, did he enjoy irking the Pharisees? <laughs> that's not his aim in life, though. I know that's not his aim in life, but, you know, he, ha he does have he kind of, uh, right. humorous. So you know, why, why was he angry? Well, because um, they were accusing him of working on the Sabbath, and you're supposed to not do anything on the Sabbath. That's well, one thing, well, but it's well, really the minor thing. Uh, uh, Evelyn? They're hard to more interested in the rules than in the health of a man. The Chris? Being in the man. Their hardness of heart. Yeah. yeah. Well, and they were out looking to accuse him because he was starting to cut into their territory as far as preaching and teaching. They might, they might lose their jobs in the synagogue. What makes God angry is our sin, but more than that is our refusal to accept his will, mm -hmm. to believe in him. 
Mm-hmm. That's what grieves yes. his heart. Mm-hmm. You see, if if God loves us and he wants to give us something and we say, no, no, I, I don't need that. I don't want that. Uh, you can't give me that. I don't think it will work. All the excuses that we give for refusing the, the work of God in us and for us. And we forget. And, and so we worry uh, instead of uh, receiving the goodness of God or waiting for his good time to answer our prayers. That grieves God mm-hmm. in his heart because if you love someone and you want to give them something and they refuse it, how do you feel? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's on the human scale, but look at a, on, on the God to human scale, that God treating our diseases and healing us of sin that he wants to and daily forgives our sins for the sake of Jesus. And then we say, I have not sinned. Oh, no, 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 no. Please come and tune into God's word and, and admit your sin and ask God for forgiveness and repentance. Stop doing it. Okay, God, have your way with me. I, I'm wrong. You understand? That's a softening of the heart. Mm. I want to bring that out because there's more than one healing the most important and the healing that god wants to bring is the healing of the hearts you know uh, pastor um I, i've mentioned my situation and everything but i've always been a what i thought was a giver in the sense of things little presents and stuff i just can't my mother even said i gave too much one time. but uh, about in the last three or four years, I have given things and they were not accepted, which I couldn't believe how how awful that made me feel. It really did. And um, it, it was like, wow, so you're describing that and how, how God must feel. Exactly. You, you hit it. I want to give them life, <laughs> real life. <laughs> And now and, and, and also forever. Here's another miracle. The centurion's servant, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion, you know, that's a soldier who has command of 10 of a, of a thousand, get the right word, pastor, please, a, a hundred soldiers came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home suffering greatly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one go and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my servant do this. And he does it. To the centurion, Jesus said, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Because he believed. It is Jesus who heals. It is the man who receives. And the go-between is the servant's leader, boss, Mm -hmm. the centurion. He's paralyzed. It's instantaneous, and it's done at a distance, and it is done on the basis of one thing, the word of Jesus. Does the word of God have power? Yes. Yes. Most certainly it does. I want you to believe that. When God says in his word to you, you are forgiven, you are forgiven. Don't make an argument out of it. When God says to you, I will care for you, his word is is complete and honest and true. It's not going to come back undone. 
let it be done for you. And you hit on the right word when you said it was done on the basis of his faith. As the centurion's faith, not the, not the paralytic's faith. So, so that's the second centurion. Pardon? That's the second centurion. Yes. But the first one was his child, right? Yes, that's mentioned in another miracle that, that we haven't covered. Yeah. Okay. So there's a, a instantaneous, and it's done by the word, and faith is present. But not in the man that is healed. It's interesting. And it must have been a surprise to him. <laughs> A moment ago, I was paralyzed. No, I'm not. I'm sure the centurion, when he came back, explained. Who is Jesus? Uh, let's sum up what we've been doing here. Um, consider the last five miracles that we have covered. No, it wasn't the ten lepers. That's a misprint. It was the leper. I'm sorry about that misprint. And the paralytic man who couldn't walk, and a paralyzed man unable to walk for 38 years, and a man with a withered hand, and another paralyzed man. Consider these last five miracles. With love and compassion, having in himself the power and authority to heal, Jesus restores each one completely. Jesus makes a restoration. The 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 creation, Romans 8, is suffering under the, the worldwide load of sin and corruption, and it has affected not only the mind and heart and soul of every man, woman, and child, but this corruption that it has come upon the world because of sin has also affected the physical, the physicality, the physics and chemistry and everything else in the world. I don't think you, most people, when they think about this, it seems impossible, but the creation longs to be restored, Paul says, as though creation had a mind and soul of its own in Romans 8. So when, when God comes through his word and makes a healing, whether it's through medical means or a direct miracle, or any means, well, it's still God entering into the physicality of the world and making a change. He makes a change that nobody else can do. Again, whether he does it through modern medicine with chemicals and procedures and therapy and all the other things that go into healing to these days. God is working behind the scenes and making it work because it is only through the physical principles that God had originally put into this world that we're able to do these things with, with chemistry. And when I said physics, I was talking about the, the exercises that are done after someone has had an operation and does physical therapy. What is physical therapy? But a, a restoration of the muscle and nervous systems and, uh, and the strength that comes into the body through nutrition and the exercise itself. I've had physical therapy and it was wonderful. Someone cared for me. God did. But he, he, he took this uh, um, man named Austin who knew what he was doing. And he told me, you have to do 30 of this and 30 of that. And I thought, oh, I don't want to do 30 of that. He said, do you want to get well? <laughs> you understand? If you ever had the physical therapy, you know what I'm talking about. Well, Jesus does the restoration. Are these miracles evidence for believing Jesus is God in the flesh? Yes. Would anyone doubt? I'm sure there's going to be people say they were tricks or they weren't <laughs> sick or what have you. Yes, mm. there are many people who, who thought that. Such physical disabilities, and we're going to close with this paragraph, please, trying to sum up, and then we'll do more, if you will, if God is willing, next 
next time we get together. These physical disabilities, diseases that we still have with us today, paralysis and skin disease, they make normal life difficult, or I, wanna, I don't wanna say impossible, but there are millions who suffer with these kinds of diseases. Hospitals and nursing homes and physical therapy centers are just filled with them. Some are healed through this medicine we're talking about in which God himself is at work. And may I say, others simply learn to live with what they can't change. All right. I say to you, as one who has seen many diseases in my life, not as many as you practicing uh, nurses have done, but I've been at the bedside of many people who have a disease that cannot be cured. Mm. And there is an acceptance that sometimes comes and sometimes not. All right. Doctor, you mean there's no cure? No. Then I, I have to learn to live with this. And the word live is a very powerful word in that sentence. I can learn to live with what I cannot cure. And with God's strength and with his word of promise and with having something to do that is valuable and try to live a life of obedience and faith, um, loving people, you and I can live with the things that we're not going to be cured of, right? And this is what I want to leave you with as we pray, Lord God, you know us inside and out, and we know how we are troubled by the things that age and disease have brought upon us. We thank you for the ability to still witness to what you are doing in our world. And we ask you to be with us and, and with those we love and those for whom we pray. And bring to us and to them an acceptance of the things that we can't change and faith in you, if you will someday heal us completely in the day of resurrection, which you have promised us. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who has come to take away our great disease, a disease of sin, that we might live with you forever in his name. Amen. Amen.